Okay, well then that's your job. Yeah. All right, so for our first... Actually, I have a challenge for you before we get started. What? On today's episode, I would like to describe my dream to you that I had last night. (laughs) And then you will have to figure out a way to segue it into the episode. (laughs) Okay, okay. Does that sound like fun? Yes. Okay, so today we're talking about Aquatar, a court of thorn... What is it? A A court court of of thorns thorns and and roses. roses. Uh, The acronym is so much better. It is. You should have just called it that. Yeah, yeah. Aquatar... Written by, by Sarah, Sarah J. J. Mass. Mass. Did you look it up? Yeah, it's Mass. Okay, it's Mass. So you've been pronouncing, mispronouncing all of your words. Um, yes. No, I knew it was Mass. Okay. I knew it was Mass. But it's you just every called other her Mass. Name. No, you called her Mass. No, you called her Mass. No. Mass. Yes, you did. This I podcast remember. is over. <laughs> you called her Mass. <laughs> okay. Because that's I didn't how, know. That's what I remember. Okay. Well, I probably did. I say everything wrong. Okay. So... You got that one wrong. And we'll go over all the other names in this book that you've got wrong. Yeah, it's all of them. Because there are many weirdly spelled names. Yes. <laughs> um, which I can't blame you for. I would have pronounced it Moss. Maybe I did say Moss. I'm pretty sure, I'm sure we I both did. have said it both ways so many times that we don't know which is which. Okay, let's get to the important part of this podcast, which is the dream that I had right okay. before I woke up this morning. <laughs> <sighs> it was so weird. Uh-huh. So um, I was invited to an old college professor's apartment for uh, February presents. <laughs> and I know it's, th- that sounds weird because it's it doesn't exist. Year. Maybe yes, it's a it leap year. Yes, it is. Maybe. But it was at the beginning of February. Oh. <clears throat> and he was dressed up as Santa Claus. And my um, one of my friends from high school who I played soccer with was also there. And oh. so was his little brother. <laughs> and his little brother was dressed up like an elf. Oh, Merry Christmas in February. Yes, and you'll never guess the music that was playing. What? It wasn't music. It was just a loop of a Santa Claus saying, ho, 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 <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And the four of us were just sitting in there awkwardly, and I was just kind of waiting for them to do something. Uh-huh. And then he said something. I don't remember what he said. It was a dream. It's weird dream logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was just sitting there smiling like, I just invited Tanner over <laughs> for February presents. And then he pulled out these gifts, and he gave... My friend from high school, this towel, oh. it was like poorly wrapped up, it was like a beach towel, and then he handed me a beach ball, like one of those cheap beach balls, it was uh-huh. wrapped up in like paper wrapping, I was like, well, I wonder what this is, and he's like, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I woke up. I love it. So figure out how to segue into the episode now. Okay, I'm going to keep that on the back burner. <laughs> okay. No, no, you have to segue it now. Right now? Yes. Okay, well, you see... In the Spring Court, there's a festival, there's actually multiple festivals, and Mm. one of which actually is Christmas in February, but they don't call it Christmas in February. Okay, this is a stretch. (laughs) when Tampon, I mean Tampon, Tampon. everybody calls him Tampon. Really? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) When he tries to woo his woman by Mm -hmm. playing the fiddle. Yeah. Um... This infiltrates her dreams, and then she has a very similar dream that you had. Okay. That was so bad. No, that was awful. (laughs) (laughs) That's not where I would have gone with it, but I applaud your effort. Thank you. And it was an interesting challenge, don't you think? Really testing your improvisational skills. Yeah, and I did poorly. Yeah. but That's what what I get for being captain of the college improv team for two years. Yes. You see, I was just... Testing your education. Yeah. See if you got your money's worth. And I'm sorry to say that you didn't. <laughs> I would have said, there's Valentine. You celebrated Valentine's Day in your dream. You probably were dreaming about love because you just read Akotar. Oh, well, that was way better. <laughs> I was trying to make the dream fit into the world. No, it's okay. Like I said, I was testing you. I was a professor. professor. I knew the answers ahead. So um, it's not fair. <clears throat> but anyway, we read... Aquatar. Yep. You told me to read Aquatar. Yes. Which apparently is one of your favorite books. I really like it. I think it's very entertaining. Um, very entertaining. Yes, it's very entertaining. I I really like it. This Aquatar itself is not my favorite out of all of Sarah J. Mass's works, okay. but I really like Aquatar, and it's where most people start with okay. her works. So you tell me. Um, where you started with this book, mm-hmm. how many of her books have you read, Okay. Um, why you like Aquatar, yeah. why you wanted me to read it. Yeah, so... Stuff like that. I have two friends. That's Shout it. out to Hannah and McKinley. I love you. Hannah and McKinley, 
I hate you for making me read this book. Yeah, they made me read it. They okay. both have loved it. They're huge Sarah J. Mass fans. And, ha like, McKinley's been reading Sarah J. Mass since high school, I think. I don't know. She's been a fan for a long time, and so oh. has Hannah. So when did, do you know when this book came out? I don't, actually. Okay. I do not know. But did you read it in high school? I did not. Okay. I just read it for the first time last year. All right. And my friends were like, oh my gosh, you should read it. We share book recommendations a lot. We talk to each other about books a lot. We all love them. And I read the first one and I was like, uh, it was fine. And they were like, it gets better. You have to read the second one. So uh -huh. I read the second one and then read all of Sarah J. Mass's works last year in like a month or two. Wow. Which is pretty fast because there's 18 books and it's Jeez. a big, it's a big world. I really I plowed through them. So it became um, your personality for an entire I month. I really did enjoy them. Okay. I really did. And I liked Akatar just because it's the first, like, I hadn't been reading for a long time. And then I read Akatar and it kind of got me back into reading again, which is another popular thing. People will mm. start it and it'll get them back into reading. Mm. Okay. And it's... It was just really fun. It had been a long time since I read a new book. Mm -hmm. I really, I reread Percy Jackson once a year. Yeah. I reread Shannon Hale's stuff a lot, but it was the first book I had read, like, new hmm. in a long time. And I really, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would at first. I was of the kind first of one. yeah, you didn't and really I was like that much. Yeah, and I was kind of judging myself for reading a lot. Like yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, this is just some crappy fairy smut, basically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, it's so bad. I don't want to like it, but I really did enjoy it. The characters are fun. The world building is interesting. Mm -hmm. I like the problems between human and fairies. I think yeah. that there's some really rich lore there yeah. that's, that I really enjoyed. And I really enjoy that there's like some mystery aspects to these books and you're, the main characters solve them. And as you go, you're like, oh my gosh, oh, I saw that coming. Or, whoa, I did not see that coming. That yeah. was an interesting twist. And so, yeah. Yeah. I... I, so I guess for you, Aquatar might have been what The Way of Kings was for me. Yeah. And I know eventually we'll get to talk about The Way of Kings eventually, um, but you're going to need like three months to read the first book. <laughs> it's really long, and so uh -huh. I hesitate to make you read that one, so I've kind of been stalling. Um, Aquatar is a much more approachable introduction to a big fantasy series yeah. than The Way of Kings is, especially if it's like you've never read Brandon Sanderson before. But... Um, it sounds like for you, and I think most people are like this, they read when they're younger and they find some books that they love and then they don't really fall in love with reading and they just kind of like go back to the things that they're familiar with. Uh -huh. um, I did that too up until I read The Way of Kings. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my goodness, there's this whole big wide world of these interesting things that I want to explore. Mm -hmm. And then I want to read more new stuff. Like what else is out there from other authors that I've never considered? Yeah. Um, and that was maybe five years ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've just been looking for new things to read ever since then. And I yeah. think it's kind of been the same for you where it's like, I'm willing to broaden my horizons, mm -hmm. find new things I didn't expect. Yeah. Um, read old things that, you know, people have said are like time and tried, uh, and, time, true. tried and true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, classics, um, which we would also I think that would be fun to do. Yeah, I think so too. But, um, yeah, I don't know where it's going that, with that. I guess I was saying, I guess what I'm trying to say is that The Way of Kings is like fantasy for boys. Yeah, <laughs> and Akatar is fantasy, fantasy for, for girls. girls. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I don't think that's a stretch. I think no. that's probably pretty accurate. Yes, because n most straight white males my age, at least, are like, oh, The Way of Kings is the best book I've ever read. Yes. and It's like this massive tome of knowledge, just one big action story about a very depressed soldier. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and I feel like um, Akatar is the same way for a lot of women my age, especially. Right. And, like, there's, of course, there's people who don't follow that stereotype, but, like, a lot of the people that are my age or our younger sister's age have read Akatar and really enjoyed it or yeah. like, and it kind of has become a cult classic, I would say. Uh, I would say it's bigger than that. Yeah. Like book talk I'd say it's hugely popular. is all about Akatar and Sarah yeah. J. Mass's work and her newest <clears throat> book comes out at the end of this month and 
you're gonna read that. Yeah, I am. I'm really and excited you're about make it. Me read that. I don't. Eventually. I don't know. I don't know about that one. But okay. If you want to, you can. We'll see. Um, we've talked about this before outside of the podcast, but um, unless like you feel compelled to keep reading out of a series like Assassin's Apprentice, mm-hmm. I don't want to make you keep reading that series. Yeah. And you've expressed similar feelings. Yeah, I agree. And so, I do want to keep reading Assassin's Apprentice, but okay. I don't want to force you to read 18 books of... I could do it, honestly. You know, I did didn't enjoy want it. to. And I guess that's a good segue to just talking yeah, talk about, about the, the actual book, book um, and what I thought about it. So my general thoughts are that I enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad. I was nervous. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Um, I did not love it, Mm -hmm. but I can see its value. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really don't have a lot of bad things to say about it. Mm -hmm. Basically none. All of the things that I have to say about it that, that I didn't like were personal taste things. Mm -hmm. So. Did um, you like how many times she uses the words watery bowels? Did she say that? (laughs) Bro. <laughs> I guess she did a few times. People people search through her books and see how many times she uses that phrase specifically. And it comes up too often. So much. Anyway. I guess I didn't notice it that much. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Maybe it just like washed over me. Hope so. I guess it was to describe like, like someone so terrible. Yeah. Yep. Like her bowels. I guess it was used to, she would use that phrase to describe someone who was like terrified. Yeah. So they'd relieve themselves. Yeah, and and it okay. also happens like throughout all five of the books. So right. you only got the first one. No, I know that she mentioned it a couple times. I guess it didn't really throw me off that much because I don't know. I'd be I read... so scared I'd poop my pants if I saw a giant worm trying to eat me. Yeah, I would too. I guess. Uh, yeah. I I think maybe she's just trying to be like. This is how realistic it is. People would actually act this way if they were faced by a giant worm. And yeah. sure, probably. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. I I've never faced one. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's just trying to paint a picture. Come on, yes. guys. Yes. Give her a break. She's a descriptive writer. <laughs> and I think she is a descriptive writer. Maybe that's one of the first things we should talk yeah. about. Um, is the writing. Mm-hmm. Because you, before I read this book, said you really didn't like it. and You thought it was bad. Yeah. My first time I read through, I just feel like... A lot of the sentences sometimes were redundant. Like, mm. and I haven't, I I started rereading it and I watched a recap before this episode to okay. prepare myself, but it's been a minute since I've read this first one. And I don't know, there just were times when I was like, wait, what? She said the same thing three times in one mm. sentence a little bit. Right. But, but with her other books that I've read, I don't know. I really think she's a descriptive writer. Yeah. I enjoy how much she puts into describing like settings and clothing mm-hmm. too. She describes clothing a lot. Yeah. Um, she, I'd say she's a very visual writer. Mm-hmm. I wonder if she is an actual painter or an artist yeah. or something. Because the main character, Feyre, is also an artist. Mm-hmm. And I do, I did like her descriptions. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a lot of flowery language. Mm-hmm. And I can see how you could feel like it was... At times redundant. It's yeah. Like, you didn't really need to describe the shaft of sunlight in three different ways in the same paragraph. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that didn't bother me okay. very much personally. Yeah. Um, I like that type of stuff too. Maybe yeah. I'm just um, open to that type of writing. Maybe because I can see myself trying to write yeah. in that way. Where I, it's like, I'm really going to try to impress you with like my vernacular. Yeah. And I even used the word vernacular, <laughs> which is yeah. fancy. I think I agree with that. I think I really was so judgmental about myself reading this oh. book that I was like... You didn't want to like it. I didn't want to like it. I mm. genuinely think that's true. That's and like, interesting. Rereading it, I was like, oh, Tanner's right. This is... This is totally great. This is totally fine. I thought it was good, so personally. I, but I, think, I mean, I, think, I don't know everything. Yeah, I think I was definitely shaming myself a little bit for reading okay. it because I was like it's inappropriate yeah you know what I mean or I don't want to be I don't want to like the things that everyone else likes yes I definitely have that streak yeah in me, where it's like I had no idea how popular the way of kings was and if like I had four or five friends telling me dude you've got to read the way of kings I would not have done it yeah so I understand you know that resistance <laughs> yes. to wanting to like <laughs> to not wanting to like something that's so popular uh-huh um, because you and I, we want to feel like special little butterflies. I am a special little butterfly, and I only read indie books. <laughs> You've never <laughs> heard of kidding. this one. This is true art. 
It's just a paper bag with some <laughs> scribbles in it. No, it's my second grade reading journal. Yeah. <laughs> Not even been published. <laughs> That's how smart I am. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't think the writing was... I actually thought the writing was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really notice her style change over time, which is something you usually do notice. I don't know if this is her debut novel, but this feels like one of her first books. I honestly can't remember what her order of publication okay. is. Okay, we probably should have done yeah. some research. I'm gonna, no, we don't have to look it up right now. But I want to know. Okay. It's okay, we'll look it up later. Yeah, we'll look it up <laughs> later. That's not what this podcast is about. If you want a history lesson... Go to Wikipedia. Yeah, and I'm going to edit all the entries. <laughs> yes, so that we look smarter. Yes, with our expanded vernacular. Mm -hmm. And we just use that word again. <laughs> um, we should briefly go over what the story of this book is. Yes. So you just did a recap. I just finished the book. Um, who will give a better recap? I don't, don't know. I think... Okay, I'll give a recap. Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> um... So basically, the plot structure of A Court of, Thorn of Thorns and Roses is that Feyre, it's kind of like a Cinderella story at first. It's, it's, <clears throat> sometimes it's given off as a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but it starts out with Feyre living with her two evil twin stepsisters. Yes. They're not really evil one twin stepsisters, but one of them is quite <laughs> evil. Um... And she's, Farah is the hardworking youngest one. Um, she's the smartest, was most capable, and all of her work goes unappreciated. Mm -hmm. So you feel a bunch of empathy, empathy for her. She goes out into the woods one day to hunt for food because her family's poor and starving. And she sees this gigantic wolf and she thinks it might be a fairy. So she pulls out an ash arrow. Mm -hmm. And ash is the only thing that can kill a fairy. Mm -hmm. Um and iron, mm -hmm. and she shoots it with an arrow and kills the wolf. Um, she skins it and brings the deer that the wolf was hunting back home to, to eat, and then lo and behold, a fairy in the form of a gigantic golden wolf with elk horns mm -hmm. bursts into her family's cottage and says, one of you murdered my friend, now I need to demand the treaty be fulfilled um, I need to take a life for a life. So mm -hmm. I can either kill you or I can take you back to Prithian, which is the land of the fairies, and you'll be stuck there forever. Yeah. Not as my slave, but you'll be stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, so Farah goes back to Prithian with this uh, fairy whose name is Tamlin or Tampon, apparently. Yep, is there a reason why people call him Tampon? Um, you will have to keep reading if you okay. want to figure that out. Okay, well then now I really thing. want to read the next book. Purely to find out why people call him Tampon. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's my primary motivation. <laughs> anyway, she goes back with Tamlin and mm -hmm. um, she sees him as her captor. But eventually she falls in love with him. Um, we find out this great twist in the middle of the story. And then uh Tamlin is in danger and Fairy has Feyre mm -hmm. has to rescue him. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic overall outline of the story. Yeah. Um it's fairly straightforward. Um I would say maybe it's cliche, but I'm not sure as far as like the plot structure is concerned. Um I, I think that's hard to say because I feel like a lot of people pattern YA fairy fantasy off of these books. So it's kind yeah. of like Eh, all stories steal from each other. Of course. I feel like it's... I don't have a problem with cliches. Yeah, me either. Assassin's Apprentice is very cliche. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yeah. But as long as it's done well, I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're reading sci-fi fantasy, what sets apart that genre from any other is the world building. Mm -hmm. That's where you can have the most control to do something so weird and outlandish um, that it stands out from all the rest. And... Uh, in Aquatar, I would say the world building is very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, just to compare it to the first two books that we've done for this podcast, both Bonesmith and Assassin's Apprentice, I love the world building in Assassin's Apprentice, and I enjoyed the tone of the world building in Bonesmith. Mm -hmm. But I feel like um, it felt Aquatar a little, does... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, Bonesmith felt a little unfinished. Yeah, not quite thought, thought through. It didn't yeah. feel that... Um, 
expansive or mysterious. Mm-hmm. Um, and Aquatar stands out in stark comparison to yeah. Bonesmith. Yeah, there's a lot of deep, deep lore. and It feels deep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, the author gives a sense of very thought out stuff like you can tell that she has spent a lot of time working on this world and understanding the complexities of it Mm -hmm. and tying it all together which makes it feel very complete to me yeah um and something that i'm gonna sound like an i'm an acolyte of brandon sanderson right i've watched his (laughs) lectures on youtube one thing he talks about what makes a good good world building is that you make a hollow iceberg Mm -hmm. So the tip of the iceberg is where the primary substance of your world building comes from. That's where you do the most of your your work, where it feels like you are learning something new about this world. There is a promise, progress towards that promise, and then a payoff um, specifically about your world building. And then everything underneath the iceberg is hollow. Mm -hmm. So when you see the iceberg, you think that underneath it, there's this deep... um, massive amount of ice Mm -hmm. um, underneath it. And that's something that Sarah J. Mass does a good job of, I think. Yeah, I do too. Is you have a sense that she's thought out all of these different things and done this research of like going back to classic fairy lore Mm -hmm. from like Wales and England. Yeah. um, I haven't done my research into that stuff. But it felt um, like, you know, talking about creatures like the puka or the surreal or mm-hmm. the... Naga. The naga. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to call them the nomads. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. They're all made up words. Yeah. But I wonder if those creatures were actually pulled from some real mm-hmm. fairy lore. Yeah, I think... I also haven't done a lot of research on that. I think they yeah. are. I've definitely heard of the naga before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really loved... I love when I get a fantasy world that is not just, ooh, people with magic, but it's like... There's fairies, there's shape-shifting, there's evil creatures that lurk in the dark. If you're out alone, you'll get kicked. Like, I love that deep stuff where it goes past just our world, but add magic. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's the hollow iceberg stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff where it's like, um, Feyre goes for a walk in the gardens and she can sense something following her Mm -hmm. and breathing down her neck and she can hear something giggling and she turns around and there's nothing there. Mm Mm-hmm. Like that type of stuff, it's like there's no actual substance there, but that's the purpose of that type of world building is to establish a sense of tone, Mm -hmm. to make you feel like there's more substance to this world than there actually is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's there's a great moment where when she's trapped in Tamlin's Manor, Mm -hmm. where she sees her dad come into the window and say, I'm here to rescue you. Come with me. And she follows him and starts to leave. And then Tamlin comes out and is like, you are such an idiot human. You fell for this. This mm-hmm. is a trick. You're going to get murdered. That was not your dad. So Do she you turns think... around to see her father again, but it's transformed into her ash bow. Yeah. And then it transforms into her sisters and then back into his her father. Yeah. It's yeah. really it's really interesting. I like that. Yeah. So do I. And that stuff is really well done. Um, just to talk briefly about Bonesmith again, my main problem with the world building was that... Um, the ghosts in that book weren't very interesting. Mm-hmm. They were all the same, even though there were five different tiers of ghosts, mm-hmm. five different types of ghosts, but they all did the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah J. Mass does the opposite of that. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, she's in the world of fairies, and um, Feyre has been raised believing her whole life that fairies are these evil, dangerous creatures, and mm-hmm. they're so mysterious. And then she runs into all sorts of different types of creatures. Yeah. And fairies are far more varied and unique and distinct and interesting than she had once originally planned. Yeah. And that makes your world feel really rich. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's always fun when you have a main character with such a great, flawed ideology, especially mm -hmm. that being such a big part of her character, too. It's fun when you have them confront the truth of what the world around them is versus what they've been raised to believe. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And that's part of that. When I said the tip of the iceberg, the substance of your world building um, needs to have a promise, a progress and payoff towards that promise. Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. um, When you described Feyre, you know, confronting this original idea of what she thought fairies were like, Mm -hmm. having that change. And then at the very end, it's paid off when she falls in love with the fairy. Mm -hmm. Um, so to briefly go over to like some of the main characters yeah. besides Feyre, 
Um, obviously, her love interest is Tamlin, mm -hmm. the original fairy who captures her and mm -hmm. takes her into Prithian. And he's the High Lord of the Spring Court. Yes. And in the land of Prithian, there are several courts. Mm -hmm. um, there's seven. Seven. Oh, yeah. there's, so there's exactly several. Yes. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, there's, I'm not going to list all of them, yeah, but there's okay. like spring, winter, summer. Um, Sp yeah. Spring, winter, spring, summer. Spring, winter, fall. summer, fall. I guess we're listing all night, of them. Night, day, and dawn. Okay. So you can list all yeah. of them. Thank you. Basically. And I might not have used the correct verbiage, but. Yeah, you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and each of those courts, they're like different territories or countries, and they're led by a high lord. Mm -hmm. And Tamlin is one of those high lords. And he is in charge of the spring court. Yeah. Um, so the other part of the world building, the substance of it, the tip of the iceberg, is what the high fae are capable of doing mm -hmm. um, and what their abilities are. And you've got your basics. You've got your basic magical creature stuff. Strong, fast. Immortal. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful. Beautiful. They're all beautiful. <laughs> Everyone in this book is just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. There's no ugly people. Yep. Unless you're a villain, then you're like not that pretty. Yeah. Which is kind of like... I don't know. Amarantha is hot. No, she's not. Yes, she is. No. Yes, she is. I'm telling you, Faye says, wow, she's really not as pretty as I thought she would, would be. Oh my gosh. What? Well, she was hot when I read it. Okay. In your mind. <laughs> she could have been. Maybe. I mean, beauty is subjective. Yeah. She was um, hot to me. Not hot to you. No, I'm yes. just kidding. <laughs> but Fe Feyre and me, we have good taste. There you go. So the other thing that I want to talk about was the introduction of this story. Mm -hmm. I spent way too much time thinking about it and taking notes on whether or not it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out if I liked it. Because there were things that I did like about it. Uh -huh. um, I loved that the characters in this book all had interesting backstories and histories that informed their worldview. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most compelling things about the beginning of this story was why did this family uh, lose their wealth mm -hmm. and fall into poverty? Because it begins with uh, Feyre living with her father and her two sisters, Nesta and Elaine, mm -hmm. in a tiny ramshackle cottage. Mm -hmm. um, and like we said earlier, Feyre is the only one who's providing for them. She hunts, she makes all the money, she makes all the food, she probably cleans the house. Yeah. And Nesta um, especially really misses their former life of riches mm -hmm. and their father who's injured he uh we don't know why i think at first we do yeah okay. he owes yeah. some people some money and they beat the crap out of him because yeah. he doesn't pay it and basically he can't walk anymore yeah yeah um and he just whittles wood all day just stares to a fire like this dude is basically comatose mm -hmm. um and Farah is very upset with her situation. Yeah. She's young. She's 19 years old. Um, but she's more grown up than any of them because her sisters just complain and take her money and take her food and don't say thank you mm -hmm. and make fun of her for being gross and ugly and mannish. Yeah. And, and also when their mother died on her deathbed, her mother was like, promise me you'll take care of them. Yeah. And she's like, okay. Yeah. So, she was 11 years old when she made that promise. Uh-huh. Um, and for some reason, she asked her youngest daughter to do it and not Nesta, who's the oldest. Or, or her, her husband. husband to take care of them. <laughs> um, we don't know why she did that, but mm -hmm. the um, one of the the primary motivation for Feyre mm -hmm. in this story is to take care of her family and keep that promise. Mm -hmm. So she says in the beginning of this book that the only reason really why she sticks around with these horrible people that she doesn't really like that much, mm -hmm. who she's angry at angry towards all the time, who don't appreciate everything she does, mm -hmm. is to maintain that promise for yeah. her mom. It's like, okay, that's good. I like that introduction. Mm -hmm. I want to know why they lost their money. I want to know how they're going to get themselves out of this situation. Yeah. <clears throat> this really crummy situation. And I also really like how from the get-go you get really, really strong character personalities, mm -hmm. too. Like, it's... I really enjoy that. You can see the distinctions between each character. Yeah. And their relationships are complex, and I like yeah. that. Yeah, I did too. Um, Nesta was especially interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, just because she was kind of like 
um, a weight around Farah's neck mm -hmm. and like not helping out very much around the house. But eventually, she, eventually she does convince her to help like chop some wood um, and tries to tell her not to like marry this boy. Uh, actually, that doesn't happen until after Tamlin okay. shows up. But anyway, um, their family's in a bad situation but we can kind of feel that they love each other, but they're all annoyed with each other and they wish that they were in a, like they had their money back because yeah. they're all starving. Yeah. Um, and there's even a boy that uh, Farrah is Involved in a relationship with? with. They're not really in a relationship. It's a situationship, I would say. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, but basically she says that they use each other for their bodies. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's been going on for weeks, mm -hmm. but she never really loves him. She's just like, yeah, that's a dude that I like. Yep. Um, anyway, all that's to say that their situation's kind of horrible. And then all of a sudden, this fairy, Tamlin, shows up to take Farah away from her family um, into Prithian. Mm -hmm. um, and by this point, she's done a good job of establishing why humans are so scared of fairies and that there was this treaty that was signed long ago. Um, and a magical wall was built separating the two races because there was years of bloodshed between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and now any human who tries to go into fairy, they never come back. And mm -hmm. the fairies are these horrible bloodthirsty monsters and it's been centuries since fairies have come into the human realm. Mm -hmm. But lately people have been noticing that they're leaking into the mortal realm and mm -hmm. been causing havoc and chaos. Yeah. And they're so powerful that there's nothing any human can do to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Farah is taken into Prithian, which is this horrible place. Mm -hmm. um, and she misses her family. Or she, she doesn't say that she really misses her family. She says that while she's in, while she's in Prithian she can't keep her promise to protect her family because they can't fend for themselves while yeah. she's gone. And they've put no effort in to learn how to hunt or learn how to make money or anything. She's like, well, they're all gonna waste away while I'm here. Yeah. They need her to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no way that she can leave fairy. I'm sorry, I keep calling it fairy. That's mind. okay. Um, that's basically what it is. Yeah. There's no way that she can leave Prithian um, without someone from there to fulfill the treaty. Mm -hmm. So the treaty, which was signed long ago, says that basically any human, it's a, basically a big contract that humans and fairies both sign to keep peace between one another. Mm -hmm. when, whenever a mortal kills an innocent fairy in the mortal lands, then they have to repay that Yeah, death. it's like a life for a life yes. kind of bargain. Um, so it's an ironclad thing, magically sealed, and if Feyre ever returns to take care of her family, then some other fairy is just going to capture her and they're going to be far less merciful to her than Tamlin. Mm -hmm. um, so that introduction, that premise, I thought was really strong. And that was the primary motivation for me to keep reading. Mm -hmm. um, I, lo I loved the idea of Feyre feeling this um, great sense of tension to return home mm -hmm. to take care of her family because she's like they need me they meet they need me and i need to keep my promise to my mother and i can't do that while i'm here yeah but i also can't leave um because these fairies are going to kill me if i do mm -hmm. um let alone even if i can like escape prithian safely just to return to the moral realm yeah because she doesn't even know where she is mm -hmm. and tamlin tells her you're only safe in this manner, on these grounds, under my protection. Yeah. Any other fairy out here is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and she tries to do everything in her power to escape, mm -hmm. um, but to no avail. And I did, I thought that was the strongest part of the book, was yeah. this first major act. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part that made her situation so interesting is that she had just killed Tamlin's friend. Mm -hmm. um, and she's forced to live with them now, yeah. forever, for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And there's this constant conflict between her and Tamlin and Lucian, who yeah. we also haven't mentioned at this point, yeah. who is Tamlin's emissary. Mm -hmm. um, and Tamlin is far kinder to Farah than Lucian is, um, which makes Farah not trust Tamlin quite as much. Yeah. 
Go ahead. I really, I really love Lucien's character. He's yeah, so really I. fun. And Pharaoh's trying to escape, and there's this great moment where she's like, how do I get out? And Lucien's like, well, there's a magical creature that you could, like, maybe talk to and try to figure it out, but you probably shouldn't. But if you wanted to, here's how you catch him. Mm-hmm. And he tells her how to catch the cereal, and she does, thinking, like, Lucien's, like, kind of trying to bait her and get her killed, yeah. basically. I just enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, so did I. No, it's a good moment. Lu- uh-huh. Lucien is a good character because as the reader, there's a bit of, it's not really dramatic irony because Farah also knows that she doesn't trust, um, that she doesn't trust Lucien. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, well, he's probably just trying to get me to, ki- trying to put, get me in a dangerous situation, situation where I can get killed. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm desperate to escape. Yeah, and it could give me some answers that no one is giving me. Yeah. Um, but the point about talking about of the introduction is that that first arc mm-hmm. was really great. Yeah. I loved the I loved the feeling of going from bad to worse. Mm-hmm. Where it's like she's stuck with her family, it's this horrible situation, she doesn't love her family, and then she gets kidnapped by a fairy, which is like a creature of her worst nightmares. Yeah. And she's living in this horribly tense situation with these people whose friend that she murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, and they obviously resent her for it. And she doesn't trust them. And she feels unsafe. So she's trying to get back home. All that stuff was great. And yeah. I think that's probably why people love this book is for that first act. Yeah. It's a really great introduction to the series. And it is a page turner. It gets you attracted to the problems, attracted to the characters from very early on. And it's, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. You're, you're totally aligned with her goals uh-huh. to return back home. Mm-hmm. Um, because you understand her motivation. Yeah. Right. You understand that she's in danger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say, and this is where one of my nitpicky things comes in, uh huh, is that I think that introduction would have been more dramatic if she actually loved her family. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to use it compare to compare this to another story, um, let's look at something like Harry Potter, mm-hmm. right? Where it goes not from bad to worse, but from bad to really good. Mm-hmm. Where Harry Potter's raised with the Dursleys, the Dursleys are horrible and someone should seriously call child services on yes. them. Yes, yes. Like she exaggerates that so far. Uh-huh. They're just the worst. He literally lives in a cupboard under the stairs. Yeah, and it's not until Hagrid shows up mm-hmm. that and tells him that he's a wizard that his life dramatically improves. Yeah. Right? Um, He's a wizard. His parents were these incredible people, and he can find these new magical powers, and he hangs out. And with he has Dumbledore. a lot of money. Maybe um, that's what she was going for to try to show how horrible the human world was, and then put her in this magical, wonderful place. Yes, yes, that that's what, what I thought at? they were trying to do was something uh-huh. like that, um, because her family was so horrible. And then she goes into Prithian, and I thought they were going to be like, well, now you're going to fall in love with this fairy, and you don't have to yeah. worry about your family anymore. And I was going to be so disappointed in that. But thank goodness they made Fairy, I'm sorry, Feyre, uh-huh. um, want to go back to her family. And Prithian isn't a magical, wonderful place. It's yeah. actually a very dangerous place. Mm-hmm. Especially for someone who doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. So when I first read this introduction, I was trying to um, figure out why it didn't really click with me for some reason. Mm-hmm. I could see that it was good, but I was trying to figure out what they were trying to do. Yeah. And so going back to the Harry Potter example, um, in this story, she doesn't go from bad to good. It goes from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. So imagine if Harry Potter was being raised by the Dursleys. He found out he was a wizard, but instead of going to Hogwarts, he had to go to Azkaban. Yeah. Right. And like the next scene, he's getting his soul sucked out by a mentor. (laughs) Like that's actually a pretty compelling idea. Uh Uh-huh. Right. Um, And I think the point is that you should have some kind of change Mm -hmm. from one scene to another whether it's like from good to great or from bad to worse mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, I like that. I think it's interesting. And I think Sarah J. Mass does a good job at slowly feeding you bits of information to keep you compelled to read. Mm-hmm. Like you're kind of like, oh, okay, she hates it here. Oh, now she's in the fairy world. Oh, she hates it here even more. Mm-hmm. Wh- what's she going to do? Like she, it's, it's yeah. baiting you to turn the page. Yeah. <laughs> Um, another story that I used as a comparison to try and figure this out was Demon Slayer. 
mm-hmm. where they do kind of like the exact opposite thing that Harry Potter does, where it starts out good and then it just gets horrible. Yes. Um, and so while I was reading this book, I was like, why don't they do something like that? Where it's like, um, maybe she loves her family and things are looking up. Mm-hmm. And this boyfriend that she doesn't care about is actually like her fiance. Yeah. And she gets engaged. Mm-hmm. And then on the, the day after she's engaged, this fairy comes and takes her away from her family. Mm-hmm. Right? So, I don't know. It's just a personal taste thing. What? If you keep reading the series, the, it's just... It, I agree with you. It would have been interesting to have her have something she would miss um, more than her duty. Like, it's almost like she misses her duty to her family yeah. more than the family itself. But... It's very well set up for the whole series. Okay, like, so she has plans? Yes. Hmm. Yes, at least I would think so, but I don't okay. know. Okay. I'm curious. I, I was just fascinated by her decisions yeah. in this introduction. Is they're not what people normally would choose to write, I think. No, but it's it's good and it's compelling. Yeah. Um, and personally, I thought to myself, maybe it would be more dramatic if she did like truly miss her family and she had good reasons for missing them. Mm -hmm. And a part of me kind of felt like this would be like if Harry Potter, Harry left the Dursleys, he goes to Hogwarts and he learns about Voldemort and how his life is in danger. And he's Mm -hmm. like, please just send me back to the Dursleys. I love and miss them so much. I want to go to the mundane human world. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So it kind of felt like that in the introduction too. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought maybe just give her like a glimmer of hope in the introduction yeah. where it's like maybe she really does love Isaac uh-huh. um, or maybe Elaine is nice she really nicer, loves Elaine or there's yeah. a true bond there yeah to me it felt like there were zero true bonds it's like with her family she's like man I gotta get back to my nine to five yeah, exactly <laughs> that's what it felt like yeah um and it sounds like to me that she has reasons for making her relationship with her family in mm-hmm. that way Mm-hmm. And maybe, I don't know, if I keep reading, I'll find out what those are. Yeah. Um, but as it stands, I think the introduction is good. And it's honestly um, a compelling idea to begin your story from bad to worse. Yeah. I really love the pitch of Harry Potter finds out he's a wizard and has to go to Azkaban. Yeah. That's an actually interesting idea. Well, because then you're like, wait, what? what yeah. Ha- then what? What happens? It's a cool subversion of expectations. Yeah. Did I use that word right? I think so. Subversion? Is that a word? I don't know, but it sounded smart. Subverting? Subvert your expectations? Subversion of expectations. I think you said it right. (laughs) Why am I overthinking this? (laughs) Um, It's a cool way to subvert your expectations. Uh Uh-huh. I think, have we talked about that in this podcast before? Uh Uh-uh. Okay, so I'm going to bring up my, open up my Bible of Brandon Sanderson again. (laughs) Um, In one of his lectures, he talks about the way that Star Wars subverts your expectations Mm -hmm. by um, telling you that Luke is a great pilot at the beginning of the story and at the end, um, in A New Hope, I believe. I haven't seen the movie in a long time. I don't know Star Wars that well. You'll get what I'm trying to say. (laughs) At the beginning of the story, Luke is a great pilot and by the end, he's flying a ship and destroys the the Death Star by Mm -hmm. using the Force, right? So it goes from this tiny promise where it's like, at the end of the story, he's going to do something great in a ship because he's such a great pilot. And then they're like, and then it's like, bah, he saves the day. He destroys the Death Star. He uses the Force, right? Uh-huh. So it goes from good to great. Um, and the example he uses to describe how you subvert expectations in that way is that imagine if you um, w- were promised to get a toy car for Christmas. And then you wake up on Christmas Day and then you get a real car. Uh-huh. So I think I've mentioned that to you at least I've before. seen that TikTok. I've okay. seen that TikTok. It's really good. Yeah. Um, and... What the introduction to Akatar does is kind of the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. It would be like if you were promised on Christmas Day to receive coal, and then you received two pieces of coal. (laughs) I don't know. But you know what I mean? It goes from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting way of inverting that um, method of storytelling. Yeah. You could also do some very interesting things. Like, this is what... uh, uh, Harry Potter does, which is on Christmas Day you're promised coal, and then you wake up and you get a real car, uh-huh. right? Like that transition from really bad to really great mm-hmm. is like so compelling, yeah. and you know, as long as you care about the character, mm-hmm. which the first chapter of Harry Potter is just heaping on piles of empathy, where it's like yes. this is how horrible he's being treated. Orphaned, he... Yeah, 
And Demon Slayer does the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's so cute. Tandra has so many brothers and sisters. They love everybody. They love everybody. Everybody's happy. And then he goes home and it's just <laughs> torn away from him, right? Yeah. So you go from your promised a car and then you get hit by a car on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I learned so much just thinking about introductions and promising things in certain ways and then delivering on those promises in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was interesting. And like I said, I don't think it's an inherent flaw mm -hmm. with the story. Um, I just think it comes down to a matter of taste. Yeah, I really liked it. I think it's I think it's very compelling, like we said. And I enjoyed watching her go from bad to worse and being like, well, how she's how is she going to get out of this? Yes. Is she going to try to just stick with it and forget her life behind her? Mm -hmm. Or is she going to go back to her bad life and leave all this magic behind? Like, it's there's no good option. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't really see a good option, which is why it's so interesting as a reader and for the main character, too. Yeah. And you do want her to get back to her family. Mm -hmm. um, and for this first chunk of the story, watching her doing everything in her power to return home mm -hmm. is fun and interesting. Yeah. Because she puts herself in harm's way again and again and runs mm -hmm. into these dangerous magical creatures. At every roadblock, she finds out that, you know, there is no way for you to go back. You have to stay here with Tamlin. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not until Tamlin tells her, basically, that you can't go back and you have to stay here that... Um, she finally accepts her fate. Yeah. And the way that he does that is by saying, like, I've taken care of your family. Yeah. Um, They're well off. Stop worrying about them. So you're fulfilling your promise. Uh-huh. Um, you can just stay here and hang out. What do you want to do with your life? Yeah. And I think the biggest thing that changes is the that scene with the surreal. Mm -hmm. When she's trying to find out from this magical creature if it's at all possible for her to circumvent the treaty and return home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when he tells her no, the Naga, Naga mm -hmm. show up, these like creepy serpentine creatures, yeah. um, try to kill her. And then Tamlin comes and saves the day. Mm -hmm. And it's when Tamlin saves her life that she realizes, oh, this fairy who I thought was immortal and didn't care at all about human life actually does care about me. Yeah. And that's kind of where the beauty and beast, the beast thing comes in. Yeah. It's, where it's like, like this massive terrifying creatures covered in blood who can shapeshift into a beast <laughs> yes and there's like the blood is running down his muscles and like <laughs> highlighting his pecs and his abs and his biceps all his glory muscles are all highlighted with yeah. blood and she's like trying not to look at it but she's extremely turned on by it <laughs> she's like well maybe maybe i am fine maybe mm -hmm. i will stay here <laughs> because he'll kill anything for me yeah she's like oh great i can just be a trophy wife yes I'll be a trophy wife to this serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's not really a serial, serial killer. Because we also learned that Tamlin loves poetry. And he's he plays an the fiddle. He plays the violin. He's yes. like, how can I make, how can I woo her? And he's like, fiddle's a fiddle. And then she dances. And dances and twirls and twirls. She, all she wants to do is twirl. It's <laughs> so funny. It's really dorky. Um, but it works. Like I said, on a technical level, I can see how it's a well-told story. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's just not quite my thing. Yes, yes. Um, it really is a love story. Yeah. Um, it is. It's romantic -y. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think the final thing we should probably talk about is the big twist in the middle of this story. Yes. Um, but before we get to that, basically, after... Um, Fairy, Feyre just decides that she's content content with staying there and mm -hmm. she starts to fall in love with Tamlin. We have like this falling in love montage, like yes. a training arc where it's like, there's no conflict. She's like, okay, I've decided that my family's being taken care of and I can finally let go of my responsibility uh -huh. towards them. Yeah. Um, and now I can just paint all day. Yeah. And it's for like a few chapters. It's a long time. It's boring. It's pretty boring. I I read this on my Kindle, and I thought the book was over. Yeah. I thought it was over, and then I'm so like, I. oh, I'm only 50%? Wait. Yeah. Is this the rest of the book? I was I was seriously concerned, but yeah. then we get a twist. We do. But I understand the purpose of that falling in love montage. Uh -huh. I think for someone who is really in love with the story, they would love that moment. Yeah. Because it is a nice resolution. Mm -hmm. She does have a character arc. 
and it is satisfyingly met. She mm -hmm. even has a character arc with Lucian, which is really sweet, mm -hmm. where she's like, um, I understand why you might hate me because I killed your friend. Mm -hmm. um, and then they kind of are on much better terms yeah. after that. He's like, okay, I'll stop, stand I'll stop sending the cereal and not that after you. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. There's a, still this vague sense that he doesn't like her yeah. and wouldn't mind seeing her get killed. Yeah. Um, that period of time is kind of like, I believe the word is denouement, which oh, is like yeah. the moment after the final climax of your story where it's like, um, this is how everyone and then they heals. Live happily ever after. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what the purpose of that moment is. Mm -hmm. In terms of like, that's what a story would technically do. Yes. Um, where she's just falling in love with Tamlin. And mm -hmm. it does feel like the end of the story. Mm -hmm. um, until the twist, which is... Uh, and I don't really know how to describe this. But basically, I'll, I'll, I'll say what happens. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, Basically, there are these bad guys who are trying to kill humans again, mm -hmm. um, led by some mysterious woman that Tamlin and Lucian are afraid of. Mm -hmm. And we've got hints of this um, mysterious evil force in Fairy that's growing stronger, mm -hmm. but uh, Tamlin constantly shields Feyre from it. There is also a curse on the whole yes. of the spring court. That's connected. The blight. Is, yeah. And it's the reason why Tamlin isn't as powerful as he used to be. And why they all have masquerade masks stuck to their face. Yes. Because one party... <laughs> anyway. The blight came and stuck these masks to their faces. And they can never take them off. Because, anymore. you know, we need the reveal. Yes. We need the reveal. <laughs> and we don't know. Maybe Tamlin's going to be ugly. Yeah. That's what kept me reading. <laughs> No, of course. He's the most beautiful thing ever created on planet Earth. Because he's a god. No, it's dramatic. It's yes. good. Um, you gotta love it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I can't remember precisely what happens Shh. to make Feyre leave Fairy. Yeah, so or, uh, Tamlin, Tamlin, I think Tamlin is like, go visit your family and make sure they're well. And she's like, mm. okay. And then he gets kidnapped, right? Mm -mm. What? He doesn't tell her to visit her family oh, to make sure they're well. My bad. Basically, Rysand, Rysand, uh -huh. God, Rysand shows up, uh -huh. and he oh. is. It's like I never read the book before. Yeah, he's the um. They call him. Do they call him the whore? Yes, they do. Okay, um, because I know that's a derogatory term, obviously. Yes. Um, but they say. That he's the whore of this queen, this evil queen who's making this blight take over Prithian, steal people's magic so that they can invade the mortal realm and take over their lands again, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and Tamlin is trying to hide Feyre from him mm -hmm. for some reason because he might have um, ill intentions towards her. Um, they make Rysand, Rysand yes. leave. And then Tamlin says, Feyre, you have to leave. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to your family. It's not safe here. That's right. And then um, Tamlin tells her that he loves her several times. They make love, finally. <laughs> and it's the moment we've all been waiting for. And especially the author. Uh -huh. is just just can't wait to write these scenes. <laughs> she, it's really <laughs> indulgent and quite detailed. Yes. Um, and then... But Farah does not return Tamlin's uh, confession of love. Yeah. Because she truly does love him, but doesn't want him to feel like he's losing something else. Yeah. A anything more. Yeah. Um, she returns home to her family, finds out that, hey, they got all their money back, their lives are perfect, and she kind of hangs out with their family for a while. Mm -hmm. And it was for this stretch of the story that I was just, it just feels anemic. Yeah, you're like, what is going on? Yeah. We're just hanging out. We felt like we reached this good resolution. Uh -huh. And now nothing else is happening. I'm yeah. kind of waiting for the bad guys to show up and do something. And then it she's just taken longer. away. <laughs> yeah. And um, for someone like me who wasn't in love with the story, I didn't like these, how long and drawn out these scenes felt. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, I would just like for her to get back to her adventure. Yeah. I feel like she doesn't have a goal. We're just waiting for her to fall in love with Tamlin. Yeah. And then when she does, she's taken away from him. 
Um, and she doesn't know if he's in danger or not. And she's thinking, well, maybe I'll just start another new life without Tamlin. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, eh, I would like to return to the plot, please. Yeah, I agree. It definitely felt like an unintentional fan fiction episode a little bit. Yeah. Like, it kind of was like, oh, okay, I guess this could happen next. Yeah. But what about all these things that you've been building up to? Like, let's stop delaying that. The book is long enough. Right. Let's just get back to the original point. Right. Well, I didn't really have a problem with the length. Uh huh. It yeah, was, it's not that long. Um, a lack of a goal, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, because as soon as she stopped wanting to return to her family to protect them, then it was just kind of like halted. Yeah. Right. It felt like okay. Well, now what's she doing? Mm -hmm. She's painting and falling in love with, in love with Tamlin. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but it's just not super interesting. Yeah. Because what's getting in the way of her falling in love with Tamlin? Nothing. Mm -hmm. What's getting in the way of her painting? Nothing. Nothing. She's actually great at it. Yeah. Um, and she loves it. And she does it all day. But that sort of stuff is just kind of like washes over you. Yeah. It doesn't stick with you as much as like she tries to escape because she sees her father on the border of her, of the estates. And she yeah. runs towards him. And then Tamlin stops her and says, it's a puka. You can't trust anything you see here. Uh -huh. That's so much more interesting. Yeah. Um, and I loved all that stuff. Like her struggling to achieve... I didn't love it, but it was good. Yeah, it was her definitely trying... more interesting than yes. having no obstacles. Yes, and I think I've uh, delayed on that point long enough. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but eventually, uh, Nesta convinces Feyre to return to Feyre? To Prithian? Prithian? Oh my god, so many words sound the same. <laughs> Feyre and fairies, and I it's called Prithian, it's agree. not called fairy. Yep. It's hard to keep track. It is. Um, Nesta partly converts Feyre to return, um, but it's actually one of their neighbors who was kidnapped by Resand and the queen mm -hmm. that convinces her to go back. Mm -hmm. Because she gave a fake name when Rhys confronted her and Tamlin, um, and that's the woman that Tamlin steals and takes back to this queen to be tortured. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Resand takes Rhys her back. Resand takes her back, yeah. So... The twist is good and interesting, mm -hmm. which is Fair returns to Prithian to save Tamlin and to save this woman mm -hmm. who was captured. Alexis Spedor, is that her name? Mm, it's like Camilla Budrose or something, it, I don't know. I think know. it is Bedor. Bedor, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway. Anyway. this ev We find out that this evil queen <clears throat> put a curse on Tamlin Um and she's been in love with him for all this time. And if I'm being honest, the exposition just kind of washed over me. Yeah. I didn't, I, I, I got that they were trying to say this villain has a good motivation. <laughs> and they do, that makes sense. Yeah. But it took a while to explain and I didn't really connect with it. Uh huh. Because it kind of felt like they introduced a Voldemort character at the halfway way point of the story. Yeah, that's how I felt too. Like I said, I thought I had finished the whole book halfway through and then yeah. I was like, Oh, a new cast of characters. It's a whole new story. Yeah. And a new motivation. Yeah. Now her new family is Tamlin, and he ha she has to rescue him. Uh-huh. And she holds a lot of guilt for her neighbor f friend who was abducted, too. Like, she yes. feels bad because she gave her name to the bad yeah. guys. And that has a lot of consequences that she didn't foresee coming. Yeah, exactly. So, um, Feyre returns to Fairy, and everyone tells her, Wow, oh, you're... So stupid for doing this. She's just going to capture and torture mm -hmm. you. She won already. Mm -hmm. And we learned that um, the entire time that she was with Tamlin, it was all set up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was supposed to bring back a human woman with hate in her heart for fairies, make her fall in love with him, say that she loved him to break the curse mm -hmm. that kept him from accessing his full powers. Yes. Um, and the villain did all this because she, she's, she was in love for Tamlin, obsessed with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and Feyre did, uh, Tamlin did accomplish that task, but the only thing that Feyre didn't do to save him was to say that she loved him. Yeah. Um, and she ironically didn't say that she loved him because that she loved him and wanted to spare him from experiencing the pain of losing someone yeah. that she loved. Yeah. That he loved. <clears throat> so the last act of this book is Feyre completing these challenges three. Yes. And solving a riddle. It's a riddle. <laughs> to defeat this queen. Yeah. And personally, I actually liked those obstacles and that riddle because mm -hmm. it felt like it was um, on theme for a book set based on like traditional fairy lore. Yeah. Which I thought was cool. 
Like, you don't defeat this queen by, like, fighting her, shooting her with her bow and arrow. Yeah. That would have been so lazy. Yeah. The plot is actually pretty good. I really liked it, and I enjoy the variety of the challenges yes. and how she creatively improv improvises her way out of them. Yes, that stuff's great. Mm -hmm. Her first challenge is to defeat a worm, is to defeat a giant worm. And she uses her instincts, her wits, and her experience as a huntress to do so. A hunter, mm -hmm. excuse me, don't want to other. <laughs> um, she uses as a hunter to defeat it, and she stuns and shocks all these fairies who everyone bet on her to lose. Uh -huh. um, she has to solve a riddle to save Lucien, mm -hmm. but she can't read. She can't read! She's dumb. <laughs> um, She's illiterate! <laughs> And the last challenge is she has to kill three innocent people. And then yeah. the third one is Tamlin. He has a heart of stone. I'm rushing over all these things. The point is those challenges are good and well-written mm -hmm. and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and surprise, surprise, she saves the day. She solves the riddle. The queen loses her power. And then Tamlin just tears her throat out. Yeah. And during this whole thing, Tamlin is very neutral towards Feyre, like mm -hmm. he's pretending not to love her so much to protect her, which is interesting because yeah. he's like, he doesn't want to see how much power Amarantha could have over him mm -hmm. because of his love for Feyre. And we also get some fun relationship between Rhysand and Feyre and them having to work together, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because you're like, oh, I thought Tamlin would be the one who would do that. But yeah, it's like, it nope, it's the bad guy. Yeah, there is an interesting role reversal where it's like the damsel is the one who saves the hero in distress. Yeah. Which is fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I also really enjoyed Resand as a character. He's kind of similar to Lucian, mm -hmm. where these fairies are very smart and cunning and they take advantage of mortals because they're so desperate for their help. Mm -hmm. So um, she makes a bargain with the devil, mm -hmm. essentially, and she's... She feels forced to. She, she is she forced is. to because she's going to die. She mm -hmm. needs his healing powers. And he says, I'll heal you if you promise to visit me in my mansion once a week every month for the rest of your life. Right? Yes. That's the deal. She's like, <laughs> I have to. I have to. I'm in septic shock. <laughs> yeah. It's gross. It and is sad. Gross. Yeah. And traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is she makes the deal with Resand and he ends up helping her yeah. to achieve her task. Because so, she can't read, and he can. Yes. <laughs> He's also... Uh, he does some other stuff, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But um, I liked that cost mm -hmm. of her, you know, making a deal with the devil mm -hmm. in order to um, defeat Amarantha. Yeah. That's her name, right? Yes. Okay. She's kind of a forgettable villain. Um, her, her motivation makes sense, and it does feel personal because she's captured Tamlin, yes. who she loves, and she's trying to save him. All that stuff works. Mm -hmm. um, and it is well done. Um, I, when I finished this book, I wanted to say that it kind of felt like a paint by numbers, but I don't think that's the case. Mm. I think it's just a well-made story. Yeah. I really enjoyed the twist. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the introduction. I liked the third act. Yeah. I thought the challenges were interesting. And I thought her having to work together with Resand was an interesting cost to her defeating Amarantha and saving Tamlin. Mm -hmm. It was all good, satisfying, and well done. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I like, I really like the complex characters and relationships that we see. Mm -hmm. And I think Sarah J. Mast does a really good job at putting Feyre through these things that she does not want to do, but has no choice yes, but to do. Yes, you're right. Exactly. Just very, very... It's well As done. As a reader, you're like, mm, yes, yes, keep going, keep going. There's no way out of this. Yes. We understand why she chooses to complete Amarantha's gauntlet to save Tamlin, mm -hmm. because she loves him. Yeah. And the gauntlet itself is well designed. Yeah, that's my. that was definitely my favorite part of the book. Really? Um, yeah. Hmm. Easily. Okay. But I also love that kind of stuff like yeah i love the hunger games i love the quests in percy jackson like i really love having a okay you got to complete this impossible task but <laughs> yeah, you can't I agree. do it <laughs> like, i enjoy yeah. that yes it's a very clear um plot structure mm -hmm. that you can watch a character progress through mm -hmm. to overcome these challenges in interesting ways yeah and we know they're gonna win but that's not the point mm -hmm. it's how you respond to your fallbacks yeah that makes it so interesting and those things are well done mm -hmm. i think my favorite part of the book was the beginning mm -hmm. um just because 
I thought that was actually a more well-written part of the book. It seemed a lot more well thought out and like that last third seems a little rushed because you haven't been introduced to a lot of the characters or mm -hmm. a lot of the problems until that last third. Yeah. But I understand the purpose of it. They yeah. wanted this great twist. And the twist is great. I didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. But like we established in Bone Smith, I don't see anything coming. <laughs> um, except for one thing, actually. What? I knew at the beginning of the story that Pharaoh was going to turn into a fairy. Oh, And do you want to yes. know why? Why? Because her name... I read Aragorn when I was a little boy. And oh. he did turn into an elf person. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yep. I was like, okay, it's going to happen in this book too. When I first read the book, I pronounced her name as fairy. Yeah. I would have too, unless they put in like the, the pronunciation. The, in the writing? In the book. Mm -hmm. That's a little funny to me. Yeah, but I don't mind it. Yes, yes. That had to happen. Yeah. It's like it, the human mortal can't be in love with forever with the immortal person. No. The immortal person's going to watch the mortal person crumble and die. Yeah. That's and then the not, only one to save them is to not, make them a fairy again. Yeah, that's not good for a 18 plus multiverse book series. No, it's not as strong. <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of uh, legs on that. Yeah. Um, I would say my biggest criticism mm -hmm. of the book, and this might just be a nitpick again, like I said, I don't have a lot of problems with this book, mm -hmm. is I feel like it's kind of two books in one. I thought the same exact thing. Okay. Yep. And I think it would have been great if you expanded on the first act of the book mm -hmm. and you ended with that great cliffhanger twist. Yeah. Where it's like this entire time Tamlin was kind of playing you at first. Mm -hmm. You don't even know if his love for you is real mm -hmm. and you have to go back and save him. Yeah. And then that's the beginning of the second book. And then we're introduced to this great villain and we learn more about Resand, mm -hmm. and um, you end with the final gauntlet. Yeah. I feel like that would have been so much more satisfying. Oh. That sorry. is unfortunate. That was really loud. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's all right. Um, I feel like that would have been so much more satisfying. Yeah. And I think it would have been, you, you could have added so much extra detail and that last third wouldn't have felt as rushed as it did when yeah. I read it. It felt rushed for me too. Mm -hmm. Um, and I felt a much stronger emotional connection to the characters in the first half than yeah. in the second half. Yeah. Because the second half was just kind of like, all right, she's already in love with Tamlin. We get that. The relationship doesn't change. Mm -hmm. The most re in interesting relationship in the second half is between, between her and Resand. Mm -hmm. um, and she's already gone through her character arc in the first half of the book. So mm -hmm. she doesn't really have a character arc for the second yeah, half. Yeah, there's not a lot of change that happens there. She's still uses her same cunning and experience as a hunter to figure her stuff out mm -hmm. and she she does what she did with the cereal and the naga in the first half yes there's not a lot of change yes um i think the plot is um at its best in the third half mm -hmm. that's the way that the gauntlet is written the way that she has to defeat the worm she learns that it can't use its sense of is she she learns that it uses its sense of smell that it can't see mm -hmm. all this stuff is well done yeah um, but it does lose some of its emotional energy that it had in the first half. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like they started a fire, but they used a, too much kindling and they didn't add enough logs. It did, it burned f It burned fast. bright and fast yeah, at the yeah, beginning yeah. and then it died down. They had to quickly start another fire again, mm -hmm. um, but it just didn't burn quite as brightly and yeah. it took a while to get started. Yeah. So overall, I enjoyed it. I had some problems with it, mm -hmm. but... I thought it was good, and I would read a sequel. Awesome. I like it. I'm glad you read it. I was yeah. nervous to have you read it. I kept on second-guessing and, and being like, oh, am I really going to have him read that? <laughs> I'm glad you read it. I yeah. really enjoyed it. I... I am too, and I learned a ton. Good. Um, I would not say that this is one of my favorite books. Mm. I think it is one of my favorite books. Really? I really do like it. Okay, cool. Maybe one of my favorite series maybe right maybe like not the it. first one being your favorite book yeah. but you have books in that same series that you like more yeah okay well i guess i'll have to keep reading to find out what those books are yeah okay next episode you tell me your dream and then oh. i'll come up with the segue yes <laughs> but do you have dreams yes oh my gosh i had a weird dream okay me too tonight